and welcome back to Planet Nibiru. As always, I'd like to take a moment to thank everyone who subscribes, likes, and comments on our videos. It's an honor to have you as part of our community. Today, we will be discussing some rather serious news about the comet that has left the orbit of Nibiru and is heading straight towards Earth. As with any celestial body that is headed in our direction, there are many theories and projections as to where it may eventually end up. But this one in particular is intriguing and according to one doomsday theorist, it might just be the one that finally does us in. It's no surprise that Earth is in the shooting gallery of comets, asteroids, and space debris as we can see clearly from this depiction. This is what happens in space all the time, we just don't see it. Most of these objects, the ones in red, are called sun divers and are pulled into our sun by its massive gravity causing us no concern. But last year, NASA detected an object that could be a comet or an asteroid on a path towards Earth. The space agency claims the mysterious object will pass safely at a distance of nearly 32 million miles from Earth. But one self-proclaimed astronomer has come up with an alternative theory, suggesting that the asteroid could crash into Earth, wiping out cities, continents, and even causing a mega tsunami. The strange object was discovered last year, and it is theorized that over the last five years it has traveled inward toward the center of our solar system, passing just under the main asteroid belt and under the orbit of Mars until it will swing just inside Earth's own orbit. The object, which is a blurred line between an asteroid and a comet, was discovered by NASA's NEOWISE mission. Self-proclaimed Russian astronomer Dr. Diomen Demir Zakharovich has said it is heading straight towards our planet. He states, The object left the Nibiru system in October when Nibiru began spinning counterclockwise around the Sun. Since then, NASA has known it will hit Earth but they are refusing to tell people. If the asteroid hit Earth, he says, it could destroy cities, countries, or cause a tsunami that could take out an entire continent. We are all in peril, he states with a stern look on his face. NASA, on the other hand, does not think the object will hit Earth. Instead, it is saying it will pass nearly 32 million miles away from our planet. The trajectory of the object is well understood and the object is not a threat to the Earth for the foreseeable future, says NASA. What NASA scientists do know is that the object is relatively large, about a half a mile across. It is also quite dark, reflecting only a few percent of the light that falls on its surface. Its body resembles a comet in its reflectivity in orbit, but it appears to lack the characteristic dust and gas cloud tail that defines a comet. The object could have cometary origins, said Deputy Principal Investigator James Gerbs Bauer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. But according to reports, Dr. Zakharovich has said that his data reveals a very different background. He claims that the comet or asteroid originated from the planet Nibiru. He says that the object left the Nibiru system in October when Nibiru began spinning counterclockwise around the sun. Some conspiracy theorists believe that the planet Nibiru is set to enter our solar system this year, after being driven here by the gravitational force from a binary star twin of our Sun. They go on to claim that this accounts for the strange weather patterns, uptake in earthquakes, and volcanoes worldwide. Nibiru, sometimes referred to as Planet X, is a hypothesized planet, small star, or mini solar system on the edge of our own solar system. NASA itself claims that there is evidence that there is something large at the edge of our solar system that is causing perturbations in the planetary orbits and possibly causing a large amount of asteroids to be hurled towards our Sun. Some of these come into contact with Earth's orbit such as the Chelyablinsk meteorite that exploded over Russia on February 15th of 2013. The existence of an extrasolar entity large enough to cause these problems was also proposed by astronomers at Caltech in January last year. Conspiracy theorists believe that the gravitational influence of the rogue planet Nibiru disrupted the orbits of other planets hundreds of years ago, 
and perhaps even caused the extinction of the dinosaurs. They go on to surmise that the next disruptive passage into the solar system could happen at any time. So get in the comment section and let us know what you think. Do you think that this rogue asteroid could cause Earth a problem? Do you believe that the Nibiru system will finally make its grand entrance sometime in 2017? Do you think that Nibiru is at the center of all of the weather anomalies, the uptick in earthquakes and volcanism that we're seeing worldwide? Please let us know. Thank you for watching and we'll be back with another video very soon. On today's program, I interview Marshall Masters. Marshall Masters is a former CNN Science Features news producer, freelance writer, television analyst, and the publisher of MarshallMasters.com. Since 1999, he has been researching Earth changes and Nibiru flyby related topics including sustainable survival communities, catastrophic crop circles, impact events, and future technologies. To learn more about Marshall Masters, visit MarshallMasters.com. In this presentation, we discuss his article, Is Planet X Nearing Perihelion? and how to prepare for the coming worldwide mass extinction event known as Planet X. Like the show, comment below, subscribe to the channel, and enjoy the show. Marshall Masters, welcome to the program. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be on. Marshall, before we get going here, is Planet X and Nibiru the same thing? Yes. And actually, what we talk about is the Planet X system, because we have a brown dwarf star, it's a small companion star to Sol, which is called Nemesis. When I was in high school, many, many eons and hairlines ago, uh, that was the big rage. Everybody was talking about, do we live in a binary star system? Because 90% of the solar systems in our galaxy have multiple suns. And there's a lot to indicate that we as well you know, are living in a binary or maybe even a trinary system. And Nemesis is a mini constellation. Nemesis is in this comet-like orbit clockwise around the sun, spends most of its time in the southern skies below us. When it bounces up into the northern skies, reaches its point of perihelion, its closest distance to the sun, and then heads back south, you know, that's when things start to really go south for us. And uh, that's that's the bad time. And so it has planets and moons around it. And like, uh, you know, in our solar system, we have major planets, we have minor planets, all right? And the same with that. I talk about the Nemesis star and its three major planets, which are, uh, innermost, which is Helion, and Helion is a bright, gaseous, star-like planet. And then there's Arbota, which is the second out from Nemesis, and that is a small, rocky planet and habitable. And then the third, which is Nibiru. Nibiru is the outermost, and actually the name Nibiru stands for uh, the planet of crossing. And so when we're talking about Nibiru and we're talking about Nemesis, we're talking about the same mini constellation. The term Planet X was really brought into existence by the astronomer Percival Lowell. And there's been an ongoing search for this thing for hundreds of years. Uh, the uh, When we talk about Uranus, that was the first planet that was discovered with a telescope. But Neptune was the first planet discovered with mathematics. And uh, what happened was that they knew where Neptune was because of the perturbations they observed in the orbit of Uranus. And literally just you know, zoomed right in on it mathematically. And once they made that determination, it was very, very quickly discovered. And then Neptune uh, was observed to have similar perturbations. And then 
astronomers back then understood that there was this ongoing search for Neptune's perturber, which the term Planet X just simply means there's something big out there, but we're not exactly sure as to where to find it, but we know it exists by the manner in which it interacts with other objects in our solar system. And so that was the big reason why Percival Lowell founded the Lowell Observatory. So that gives you an idea of, of what we're looking at. We have a mini constellation coming through. That's the reason why I call it the Planet X system in just, you know, when I first started, it was just Planet X. But as we learn more about what we're dealing with, then I started calling it a system because that's really what it is. It's a mini, or more specifically, it's a mini constellation. When I was a kid in the mid-80s, we all talked about Planet X. We understood it to be the undiscovered planet beyond Pluto. Correct. Correct. And so, yep, you guys were... Uh, and interestingly enough, there was uh, an awful lot of really good reporting in mainstream media about Planet X. Um, and then it just all died. And it was uh, and it was it didn't die from a lack of interest. It died because there was a concerted effort to kill the topic. And that really uh, came into being after the 1983 IRAS mission. And whistleblowers who saw the original uh, files on this, and this comes from different whistleblowers with same access to the same files. Then these gentlemen, uh, Bob Dean is one. I think he's a very, very fine gentleman. And um, he's really getting on up there. I don't, I don't even know if he's still with us. Um but um, there were others, and interestingly enough, they weren't the officers who knew this information. They were non-commissioned officers, the guys with all the chevrons up and down on their slaves. And um, because these are the guys that they would put in the secrets vaults, and they would have the key to all the secrets. Now, you know, if you were an officer, you had different levels of security and you could see this, but you couldn't see that. But for these sergeants who were in charge of maintaining all of this, they had the absolute highest security level because they had the key to the kingdom. They could see anything. And they didn't have a lot of folks coming down and asking them for things as a rule. So what do you do? You're sitting there kind of bored and you start pulling out file jackets and readings and uh, these guys would start reading about all of this, and it would just slap, drop them on their head. And uh, because IRAS found Nemesis, and it just showed up like a sore thumb. Now, it was in the infrared. Now, here's the thing about brown dwarf stars. And they're actually uh, stars that have just been recently discovered and what we're finding is that they're far more common in our solar system, or excuse me, in our galaxy uh, than our type of star, far more common. And these things are, in terms of the uh, their mass, um, yeah, they're about 10 to 15 times that of Jupiter and several times larger than Jupiter in radius. But when you compare that with a sun the size of ours, that's like saying, you know, you got a hummingbird, hummingbird <laughs> orbiting a buffalo. So, because mass is really what determines it. And the thing about a brown dwarf star is that they can support life, uh, but they're very dirty. And the reason why they're dirty and that in turn makes them incredibly difficult to observe. That's the reason why it's a Johnny come lightly to astronomy is that they ignite like our sun does did. And then, however, they lack the ability to maintain a nuclear furnace, so to speak. And so our sun continues burning brightly because it has the mass. The brown dwarf doesn't. And so it's more like 
the charcoal briquettes in your backyard barbecue, you know, and they get white and then they bank off, you know, and if you're into barbecue, you know that, you know, you want to wait until your coals get it, you know, nice and white. And then, you know, that's, they're at their peak and that's when you put on the meat because then they start banking off and you're not going to wind up with an overcooked outer and an undercooked inner. Well, and all the gases have burned off and you're just dealing with hot carbon. Yeah, exactly. But in space, what happens with these things is they have this that happens and then they're per perpetually shrouded with all of this dust and debris that is created by their ignition, which never is able to settle into anything. And so they can be observed in the infrared, but in terms of the visible light spectrums, which is an incredibly narrow band, there's something that, you know, no, you're not going to see them until they're fairly close in, you know, and um, that's the case with this. Now, what I do with the testing and this article that I just put up is Planet X nearing perihelion. Um, there are a lot of folks, even other researchers out there, and it's it's very nice to hear. And they they compliment me on my image analysis method, which I do is called gamma testing. And gamma testing is something we can do with digital images. You cannot do it with celluloid images with film. And so with Gamma testing, it's like, you know, you have a stereo system and you can set your different frequencies, you know, highs, lows, bass, treble, all these things. And you can play around with all that. But then you have the big volume knob. And when you turn that down, turns down everything. When you turn it up, turns up everything. But there are some things that will stand out. So you turn down the volume knob, and, you know, you're listening to Bee Gees or something, and what do you get? Boom, 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 boom. You're getting the bass drum. You're getting something that can really punch through in that very limited, you know, amount of power. Well, what I'm doing, gamma testing, what I'm doing is it's just like on your stereo system. You're just cranking down the volume until you just, all you hear left is, is the drum or the, you know, what other instrument can get past it. Now, in terms of images, that gets them down to, uh, I reduce them down to hot images and cold images. And a hot image is one that is generating light into the lens of the camera. All right. Our sun is a hot object generates light directly into the camera lens. Now, cold images are lens flares and other forms of aberrations. And lens flares and aberrations are simply misdirection of other light sources. And so when you crank down the volume, because they're not generating, you know, they, they're not sitting there thump, the thump, the thump, the thump, like the bass drum, okay? Um, they're going to fade out. They're going to disappear pretty quickly. And, you know, this is because lens flares are something that are going to happen directly in front of the camera lens or with inside the lens barrel itself somewhere in the prisms. And so what I do is I use gamma, all right, which is purely a digital thing. Again, it will not work if you go out with an old Kodak camera and take a picture. No, that you don't have gamma settings with that. Gamma is only something that is new to digital photography. And that's really all you see anymore today. And uh, unless you buy a coffee table book on Ansel Adams. Uh, but I just crank the gamma down. And when I crank down the gamma, and if, you know, if your listeners go to my website at marshallmasters.com, actually there's, you're going to see what a gamma test produces 
right there in the image that it's the, right at the beginning, the one where the image says, is planet X nearing perihelion? That is exactly what a gamma test is. And you're going to see the sun, and next to it, you're going to see another hot object. And uh, that object is has a blue tint to it. The sun has a red tint to it. Um, and this is the reason why I'm saying, is planet X nearing perihelion? In other words, is it coming to its, is it approaching that point in its orbit, which is 3,600 years? It's a long period, elliptical orbit. It spends most all of its time in the southern skies, all right, until it swoops up around the sun. And it, and it, orbiting the sun actually on two axes. It's going up and down like a yo-yo, but the so yo-yo is steeply inclined. And at the same time, it's going around the sun. All right. And so it's tracking around the sun about every 380 days, opposed to our 365, which is the reason why even the ancients in the Colburn Bible tell us that it dances around behind the sun. We see it, we don't see it, we see it, we don't see it, we see it. But then eventually, as our orbits merge, all right, then, woo, we see it. <laughs> okay. And it just pops out from behind the sun. So if it's reaching its point of perihelion, what that says is that this is we're going to start getting into this phase where it is going to pop out from behind the sun so that everybody's seeing it. Now, we have folks that are, you know, reporting videos all the time. And I, what you have to understand is something that's behind the sun, the only time you're going to be able to see it is near sunrise and near sunset. So I get these folks, you know, debunkers, and they go, well, I went out in my backyard this afternoon, and I took a look, and I didn't see anything. Well, of course you didn't see anything, because the sun's too bright, and you're not going to see it. And they don't understand that sunrise, sunset, simple difference. And uh, the point I'm making in this is I have been tracking Nemesis, and I've been doing it for a very long time. This picture... Yeah which will be on the video so people can see the picture right now right is planet x nearing perihelion are you sure this isn't mercury or some kind of gravitational reflection no it's not mercury i mean you go into the easiest thing to do is you just go into solar system scope and people can go online and do that uh but i actually use uh starry night pro and that's the program that I use for this. And I go and look, but I mean, I've been looking, you know, at Venus and Mercury for a long time. And I want to tell you, Venus and Mercury do never look that big, period. Okay. And I've seen them in the gamma testing, you know. So, I mean, for me, it's like, you know, it, I, I will do this. I'll go to Starry Night, but, you know. I already know it's not Venus or Mercury or something else because it's a hot object, all right? If it's something else, then it'll be a cold object and it won't pass muster with the gamma test. Now, the interesting thing is we're continually tracking this object, which is to the sun's 3 o'clock relative to the horizon. Now, out in space, the ecliptic, the plane of our solar system, puts that more up, say, around 130, okay, relative to the sun. But we see it at 3 o'clock because the Earth is tilted, all right? And so our horizon is not the same thing as the ecliptic, the plane of our solar system. Uh, you know, I have a video, Planet X System Update number 4, and actually it's in that article, and people can watch it. And we have from Spain, Brazil, and other places where we're tracking the same object in the same exact place at different times of the year. Every case, it is not Venus. It is not Mercury. Those are very small relative to this. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Sagan. 
Oh, God, you're okay. So you want billions and billions and billions of facts? Nope, just an extraordinary one. <laughs> okay. Is this gamma shot your extraordinary evidence? I think that I'm doing the best that I can being that I don't have the resources of a government and I'm just relying on what you have. But there are, in my videos, when I put up something in my video, it's like, it's a challenge to debunkers, you know, disprove this. So in that regard, if you see it in one of my videos, yeah, it's extraordinary. Basically, you're saying there's a conspiracy by NASA to cover this up. Oh, yeah. And it goes much higher than NASA. It goes much higher than NASA. Is, I, mean, I, just, I just watched the movie Interstellar. Actually, I haven't seen the last 30 minutes, so don't blow it for me. But um, Oh, no. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I won't do that. Fantastic show so far, right? It is. Oh. Just, I've just riveted, and I have to take breaks because I have to cool off. <laughs> it's just too much. Are they just not telling us about Planet X because, just like in Interstellar, they didn't think that panic made any difference? Well, in Interstellar, the, oh, golly gee, I can't answer that question because you haven't seen the end of the show. <laughs> and I'm not going to kill it for you. Uh, but let me, and, and I do love that. I've probably seen that movie a dozen times. I just do enjoy it. And um, I, I especially love, you know, the, the human angle that they put on it. Now, the reason why we're not being told is, we are going to go through a worst case scenario flyby. Now, there's this has been well documented in the Colburn Bible, which is an ancient wisdom text, and the first parts of it were written about the same time as the five books of Moses. And um, the while the Hebrews were wandering in the Sinai, and um, it tells us that the sinking of Atlantis, Noah's flood, and Exodus were all the result of flybys of this mini constellation system through the core of our system. And uh, the reason why you have some that are best case scenario and worst case scenario, I mean, they're all going to hurt. But there's a particular part, a segment of this orbit, which is from its point of perihelion to where it arcs down to the ecliptic, the plane of the system. And when it does, it comes up and uh, it'll pass over our heads. And when it crosses the ecliptic, it'll do it between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. And... This is the phase of the orbit that's very destructive for us. Uh, I call it the kill zone. And during Exodus, Earth was on the opposite side of the sun while Nemesis was in the kill zone when it crossed the ecliptic. This time, we're going to be on the same side of the sun. And the last time that happened was Noah's flood. All right, so uh, we are going to have a pole shift event. And for those that are, you know, read their Bibles. And to me, the Bible, I, I treat it as a wisdom text. And in that regard, there's a tremendous amount of preparatory information in there about what's going to happen. Days of darkness is something that is definitely going to happen because, well, Nemesis at the ecliptic is between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter, its outermost planet, Nibiru, will be passing between Earth and the Sun, somewhere between the orbits of Earth and Venus. And when that happens, it's, you know, when we have, uh, you know, it's just simply going to be so massive, so large, that when it passes in front of the Sun, it's going to completely blot out all of the light. And then we're going to have a period of pitch black that is going to be quite disturbing. And then this is when the pole shift is going to happen because then several bodies in this system will gain a what I call lithosphere lock on the surface of our planet. And that will then cause the shift. 
and there's you have a magnetic shift and then you have a crustal shift. We're already in the process of a magnetic shift. All right. And that's the reason why they're having to go out and renumber uh, at airports the runways because the runways are all set on compass, magnetic compass settings. And those are changing. And so they have to repaint those and republish. Um, and this is, you know, when you look at what's happening, uh, it's moving around a lot more. So the magnetic pole shift is in its early emphases beginning to do. Then the also we would have uh, a flip of the magnetic poles. All right, so where north is now south and south is north. And that's going to happen. This has happened in the deep time history of the planet. And there are those that say it takes, you know, tens of thousands of years for that to happen. But they have found basalt flows, all right, volcanic basalt flows, where they could see that uh, a magnetic reversal occurred in a in just simply maybe a matter of hours or days. So we're up against it with a really negative flyby. We're going to have a worst case scenario. Now, during the pull shift event, you know, the story of Noah's flood, uh, you know, what we learned, there's, there's almost 200 different deluge accounts. All right, once you get out of the Bible and, and it's no longer Noah's flood, it's called the deluge. And the deluge was really the big slosh. Because what happens is when the lithosphere of the planet moves, all right, the, well, the water is just going to slosh up onto the continents. All right. And you saw that in the movie 2012. They demonstrated, you know, what that looks like in those huge waves coming in and hitting and just, you know, taking out vast amounts of shorelines. Well, most of humanity lives along a shoreline or within 50 miles of it. And these are all going to be death zones. So what the elites really want to do is uh, they want to reduce. This is a eugenics agenda. They want to reduce the population because it's really difficult to manage 7 billion people. You don't need 7 billion or 8 billion people to live like a prince and to be a god on your own planet. You can do it with a lot fewer people, and it's a lot easier to manage. So they're suppressing knowledge of this, not because they don't want to cause a panic, all right? Um, if they were to make it, you know, people, yeah, they would start moving inland. Things would be shifting. That would not be good for their investments, and they're not going to be able to buy as many yachts and big yachts and have their little junkets and fun and do whatever they're doing. Uh, but you're going to have more people surviving the event, which means in a time when they're going to have to regain control of the planet. We do live on a slave planet. When a thousand people own 90% of the world, okay, that's a slave planet. When, you know, you can count the number of people on both hands that control as much wealth as the third poorest of the world's population, that's a slave world, period. Let's not put happy faces on it. My God, here in America, half of all Americans, over half of all Americans do not have the money in the bank right now to write a $500 check. That's a fact. We're all strapped and we're living paycheck to paycheck. So, and where's all this wealth? It didn't evaporate. It went into the hands of those that are controlling. So during this tribulation period, there's going to be, a, you know, a destruction. And one of the things that's going to be destroyed is all of these elaborate control systems that the elites who run the world, like puppeteers, all of their control systems are going to be completely and utterly shattered. Now, they're going to be living in their deep underground bases that are a mile to two miles deep. And they're going to live very well. And these things were... You know, 
the money is that they sponged out of us in any number of different ways is what's fueling the building of these things. All right. And the, you know, you, you have, they come out and they go, gee, you know, we, we just lost billions and trillions of dollars. We don't know where they went. What do you know? <laughs> that was an, <laughs> what a big accounting error, you know? I mean, it's like, if you said that to the IRS, they'd, you know, they'd laugh at you and then uh, nail you for everything you got, including your genetic code. And so they're going to be in their deep underground bunkers and they have their seed vaults and storages and whatever. And so their plan is when things start settling down and they'll know when things are going to settle down, they're going to come up to the surface and see who's left. Now, Georgia Guidestones tell us that, you know, this is a Ten Commandments for the 21st century. Some call it that. And it's written in eight different languages. And the first one says, keep humanity under half a billion. Well, it doesn't tell us how we get there. It doesn't tell us how nine in ten of 90 percent of us are going to perish and what's going to come. It just says, Keep it under half a billion. In other words, once you're there, you're there. Don't let the population exceed half a billion for the whole world and live in harmony with nature. Well, that's what's, you know, the vast majority is along the shorelines. And when I look at people who are in denial, I mean, the three big reasons people are going to die during the coming Planet X tribulation is denial, procrastination, and location. Those are going to be the three principal causes of death. All right. Again, denial, procrastination, and location. If you can get people to deny, immediately you're going to be able to kill them in location. If you can get people who are starting to become aware to procrastinate and not do something, again, you come back to number three. You kill them with location. It's as simple as that. It is as brutal and as ugly as the Nazi final solution to exterminate the Jews in Europe. Nobody could have believed it, but it happened. It was just a simple idea. We need to kill a whole lot of people. And they went and they did it. And that's what's going to happen here. The elites have decided they need to kill a whole lot of people. And the easiest way to do it is just say, we didn't do this. We didn't do this. That big ugly rock up in the sky, that did that. They couldn't save $9 billion if they wanted. The real thing, though, is not about the number of people that are, you know, it's not about the body count, okay? It's not about the body count. But you're suggesting that there's some malevolency to this. Oh, absolutely. There is. And for people that like to give other folks the benefit of the doubt, even when they're lying to their faces, that's a hard thing to stomach, isn't it? But that's just the way it is. And uh, the reason why... They want to reduce the population. It's not because they're conservationists and they're going, we need to be good stewards of the earth and we're polluting everything. And, you know, no, that's not it. The reason why they want that many people to die is that during the tribulation, the interesting thing that's going to happen is we are going to be dying in vast numbers. But when we do, we will be dying as a free species. We will be free of the yoke of slavery. What they have to do once things start to settle down is they got to get us back. They got to get the yoke of slavery back on our shoulders. And that's where their, that's where their plan really is. So what they'll do is they're going to wait. Until, and, and this will be, we're going to pass through the tail, and we're going to have all this iron oxide and meteor showers. Matter of fact, you know, you go and if you take the story of Noah's flood and Exodus and you put them together, that's really the whole scope of what we're facing. And um, they're going to come up towards the tail end, the last major event of the tribulation. 
the tribulation will continue because the earth has gone through some very radical changes and it's going to have to settle down. There have been several mass extinction events, four or five. That's right. And actually, we're in the sixth one, which is yes. the Holocene extinction event, which is man-made. Does nature know that there's an impending... Nature understands cycles, right? So perhaps nature knows this is coming and has initiated its own mass extinction event. Perhaps Planet X is behind the mass extinction of the dinosaurs. Well, you know, that's funny you should ask, because the very first article I published on Planet X was in January 2002, and the title was, Did Planet X Kill the Dinosaurs? That was the very first question that came to my mind. And uh, a gentleman, fine gentleman, uh, at the Smithsonian Astrophysics Observatory, um, helped me, Dr. Marsden. He's passed away. Fine gentleman. He actually helped me with the research uh, on that. And it could have very well have been. See, one of the things that is going to happen here is that this system, as it comes in, is pulling a bunch of stuff behind it, but it's also pushing a lot of stuff in front of it. And it's also coming through our system like the mother of all cue balls. And so it's knocking stuff into Earth-crossing orbits that normally would never, you know, they're totally benign. They're sitting there floating around the sun or, you know, they're inside of our orbit and they're never going to be a concern to us. But this thing's coming through and it's dislodging them. And all of a sudden they go from being absolutely not a problem to a problem. And uh, they come at us. Now, an example of that is the, uh, ch excuse me, the Chelyablinsk meteor detonated over Russia in, excuse me, February of 2013. And it was really interesting when that happened because NASA was completely distracting everybody with the story about this other asteroid, and I can't remember the name of it, that was supposed to fly through a keyhole in space. And if it flew through this keyhole, then it would come back and be a real threat to the planet and so there was all this mystery and all of this wonder and all of this hype about will it fly through the keyhole on this day and on that very day this meteor detonates air bursts over Russia releasing 30 the equivalent of 30 Hiroshima atomic bombs and energy, and at that moment was 30 times brighter than the sun. I call it a 30-30 event. 1,500 buildings were damaged. I mean, 1,500 people were injured. I mean, many more buildings were damaged as a result of that event. And, you know, the media was pounding on NASA. They're going... You had us looking completely the other way, and nothing happened. It was a no-show event, kind of anticlimactic, as you would say. And then this doggone thing hits, and you didn't see it coming, caught you completely unawares. And, I mean, the media was, once in a while, I mean, we have a tightly controlled media. It's a propaganda outlet now. It is fake news. And... uh but, you know, once in a while they get on their high horse and they get, you know, they can ask the obvious question that everybody else is. And finally, NASA had to come out and say, you know, we didn't see it coming because it came at us from behind the sun. And we don't look out that way. It just happened again uh, last week, Marshall. Mm -hmm. There was a near miss, or as Carlin says, a near hit. Mm-hmm. It came extremely close, I think within one-tenth of the moon's orbit. That's crazy. That's within the orbit of satellites. That's within, yeah, yeah. And so this is the kind of stuff that's going to happen. Uh, they're going to, you know, they're going to want to keep the lid on it. Nothing to see here, folks. Move along. Um, they're going to keep assuring us that, you know, that's the way it is. Now, what I'm saying in this article is Planet X nearing perihelion. 
there are two very prominent fellows that have made predictions for this year. Uh, in 2008, on Project Camelot interview with Kerry Cassidy, uh, Bob Dean said that, you know, she's asking him, when are we going to, when's this going to happen? When's this flyby going to happen? And he said, 2017, and you can take it to the bank. That caught my attention. And then he said he had confirmed that we will, when the worst part of the flyby, when it's going from perihelion to the ecliptic, that's the kill zone, we're going to be on the same side of the sun. Okay, so we're talking about a Noah's flood, worst case scenario. This is going to be bad. Now, you have Major Ed Dames, all right, remote viewing. I've taken one of his classes, you know. Um, yeah. In 2004, he published a video called The Kill Shot. His publicist sent me a copy of it, and I kept on to it. And what I realized was that in 2004, he really had, with remote viewing, he had nailed this on a big picture basis better than anybody else at the time. And what he's talking about, a kill shot, is what we call solar sprites, all right, or uh, cosmic lightning, if you will. And this is just as simple as a bug zapper, all right, how bug zappers are going to work. Uh, if you get hit by one of these things, it's going to tear up a chunk of the planet's surface, now, you know, there are people that say the Grand Canyon on our planet was created by water erosion. And, you know, I've flown through it. I've been in the Grand Canyon and I just like, you know, I don't know that, you know, what's wrong with this picture or this explanation. But, you know, let's leave that aside for the moment. Look at Mars, the largest canyon in our solar system is not on Earth. It's on Mars, Val Marineris, massively huge. Now, are they going to tell us that there was enough water on Mars to create Val Marineris? I don't think so. But a solar sprite is exactly the kind of thing that would dig that thing in the way it did. And so what he is seeing is that we're going to, there's, we're going to have an Earth-directed solar sprite because of the interaction between Nemesis and the sun. And it's going to arc a spark, just like spark plugs, okay? You know, the spark plugs in our engine create an arc. And that is going to happen. Now, what else he, he talked about was that there was going to be a large planet that was going to come between the Earth and the sun about this time. Well, yeah, as I told you before, that's Nibiru passing between Earth and Venus and the orbit of Venus. And so the things that he saw, all right, in his remote viewing back in 2004, 2003 and earlier, yeah, dead on. And I actually uh, was uh, someone... Uh, arranged for me to attend one of his remote viewing classes. I was interested. I wanted to see if remote viewing was something that you could use as a survival skill. And you certainly can. And it's something I would heartily recommend to your listeners that they explore the possibility of learning how to remote view. It's, it's quite simple. You just need to discipline yourself to it. And... Um, yeah, you, know, you don't have it's it's not the same thing as doing psychic readings, which carry with it. Uh, if you don't really know what you're doing, you can get yourself into, you know, a twist with that. There are um, there are dangers, so to speak. But with remote viewing, you don't have those dangers. Remote viewing is something that is used by uh, intelligence agencies in Russia. They use remote viewing. The United States uses remote viewing. Russians use psychics. So does the United States. 
Uh, it's the difference of where they place the emphasis. In Russia, uh, they like working more with the psychics, but psychics are difficult to find and groom. Uh, on the other hand, in the United States, they prefer working with remote viewing because this is something you can find a lot more folks to do, basically mainstream viewing. And then you're going to have your rock stars like in Ed Dames who can go take it to a whole new level. Now, Ed, for over the years, uh, everybody has always asked, Ed, what about Planet X? Ed, what about Planet X? You know, and he, man, he just steadfastly sidestepped it every time. And finally, he was, you know, he knew he was going to be doing his uh, last major public presentation in August of last year in Las Vegas. And that was when he just came out and said, Planet X is real. And we are going to see it November of this year. And when we do, it's going to look about as large as the moon in the sky. But Marshall, we should be able to see it long before it gets here with the naked eye. Well, we're seeing it now. But the problem is everybody always says, OK, I've been seeing images of this since 2008, for God's sakes, okay, with the imagery that leaked out of the South Pole Telescope. But see, when people see it, say, you know, we're not seeing it, it's because they're not saying, well, I can't, you know, I, I, I want to walk out in my backyard 24-7, anytime, night and day, look up and see it up there. I want to see it up there. I want to see it easy as I'd see the sun or as easy as I'd see the moon. I want to see it with my own two eyes. And they don't understand. You see, that's the question that's going to get them killed. When they're asking that, when they're finally going, well, look at that. You know, Phyllis, they're standing out there in their yard or standing out in the street with their neighbors. And they're looking up. Phyllis, what do you think of that? I don't know, Jerry. That's the darn strangest thing I ever saw. Well, Phyllis, let's go. Turn on the television, see what they say on CNN or Fox or MSNBC. And they're going to go in, turn on a fake news site. Okay. And what are they going to hear? They're going to hear, hey, folks, don't worry about it. It's just an interesting new kind of comet. And it's going to pass overhead. It's going to be a phenomenal light show, but nothing's really going to happen. Okay. And they're going to, then they're going to go and have all the buffer segments about going back to Haley's Comet, you know, back when and how people were suckered into buying gas masks and placebo comet pills by con artists and all of the hysteria that formed around that was totally needless. And so they're going to embarrass everybody. See, the thing of it is when you say, when am I going to see it with my own two eyes? What you're saying is I'm too stupid to understand what I'm seeing with my own two eyes. I'm dumb. I got to have somebody else. Tell me what I'm seeing with my own two eyes because I'm stupid and I'm dumb and I can't understand what I see with my own two eyes. The people are going to live. The ones are going to look up in the sky. And they're not going to say, when am I seeing it with my own two eyes? They're going to say, when am I going to believe that what I'm seeing with my own two eyes is a clear and present danger? Those are the ones that are going to live. The rest are going to drown like rats. Okay, Marshall, we're running out of time, so let's get to it. How do we survive Planet X? Well, you can follow. That's all the work that I'm doing right now. I My book, Surviving the Planet X Tribulation, a Faith-Based Leadership Guide. And what I'm trying to do, I think that churches are going to be the ones most likely to organize people when there's the last possible minute. While everybody's watching them on CNN going, it's all the nonsense, don't worry about it. You're going to have leaders of small churches going to go, no, it's clear and present danger. I got to get my flock to safety. 
And so what my efforts are right now is helping people organize in that last minute way, intelligently, without running around like a bunch of chicken with their heads cut cut off, okay? But that they can be calm, sober, do what they got to do, get to safety and make life. And But also it's about purposeful survival for an enlightened future. And that's what I'm all about. That's the reason why I founded Knowledge Mountain Church of Perpetual Genesis. And you can find that at knowledgemountain.org. My latest book, Survival Wellness Advocacy and the Big Win, if you're interested in surviving, this is going to show you, it's going to give you a map, a plan of how to do that if you can't afford bullets, beans, and bunkers. And I give it away for free as an ebook. You can buy the print edition, but you can get the ebook for free from knowledgemountain.org. So everything that I do, Scott, er, Russell, everything that I do is I'm trying to help people to survive. That's it. Follow my work, visit my sites, and but you got to be in awareness. You got to be ready to do it. Again, the three big killers, denial, procrastination, location. Those are the three things that are going to kill you dead sure. Dead sure. But if you're in awareness and you're doing something, I don't care if you can't afford a mountain of beans and by God be worth your weight in beans for some community that is going to form and go. And this me and mine prepping with just me and my family and my friends, those people are bunker bunnies. They don't understand. Yes, we are going to have all kinds of nasties out there, cannibals and whatnot. They're going to be a food source for those people. But communities, faith-based communities of 100 or more, they're going to be hard targets. And the nasties are going to leave them alone, and then they're going to go for these clever bunker bunnies that said, I, just me and my family and everybody else can go to hell. I don't care about them. I had Matthew Stein on the program maybe a month ago. Matthew Stein, yeah, when technology fails. Fine, gentlemen. That's right, yeah, MIT guy. And he told me the lone wolf, those are the first guys to go. Yeah, he's absolutely right. He's absolutely right. But, you know, the reason why we do this, Russell, is because everybody's going and they're doing this old Cold War shelter strategy, NBR, and which is nuclear, biological, radiological. Now it is NBR plus earthquakes, and it's this sheltering thing. And the whole notion is just survive the initial event, and after that, take it as you go along. You're clever people. You'll sort it out. It is never been tried. It has never been proven. And yet, that's what people are doing. If you want to know what how to survive this, think about the pioneers. Families got together, bought Conestoga wagons. They formed large wagon trains. They'd head west, spend a year looking at the south end of a northbound buffalo. Okay? And when there was danger, they'd circle the wagons and cover each other's backs. And they had a low technology thing. Their solutions were low technology. So we do know the way to survive this. Our ancestors have shown us what works and what hurts. And that's important because survival is about learning what works and learning what hurts, and learning enough about what works before what hurts kills you. And so in the final analysis, surviving a tribulation is less about the having of things and more about the knowing of things. Because you don't want to hold on to things, we want to hold on to each other. This is the path. This is what I'm the message I'm trying to get out to folks. Now I'm doing the best I can and I hope I can make a difference in the final analysis, but I'm never going to stop trying. Now we all know about 2012. It it came and went the Mayan date, you know. 
this November 2017. Is this it for Planet X Nibiru? If it, if it doesn't come, that's it? No, it's coming. And by the way, with 2012, okay, 2012 was a Mayan harbinger date. It wasn't the event. Prophecy has a harbinger, and it has an event. The harbinger is a non-destructive signal that says you are on the timeline to this major catastrophe. We have been tracking. You look at my, we and you you go on. We have signs, articles, and videos on my website. You know, we did an analysis. We looked back at the statistical data, and right after December 21, 2012, fireballs and earthquakes just skyrocketed and they've continued to skyrocket all right so the mayans were saying here's a celestial alignment that's going to tell you you need to prepare for a bad time they didn't say it would happen on that time we were sold a bill of goods by the media they went off the deep end with that story, and now people are going, well, 2012 was like nothing ever happened and all that nonsense. No, go to my website. There's a link up there for signs. Look at my signs videos. Look at all the signs articles. We're tracking this hard data. The Mayans were, they were dead right. We were dead wrong by trusting in the media telling us all of this stuff. When I was interviewed by National Geographic, they asked me, they said, Marshall, is there a direct correlation between Planet X and 2012? At the time, because I was that was in August of 2012, I said, no, I don't see a direct correlation. They said, what are you going to be doing on that day? I said, I'm making coffee. My prediction came to pass. That's what I did on that day. I made coffee. But it wasn't until afterwards that we went back and we said, well, what happened after December 21, 2012? And that's when all of a sudden we're going earthquakes of all magnitudes, explosive. You know, it's like Roadrunner Coyote cartoons and the Roadrunner gets on the act. You know, Roadrunner is going around. Coyote gets on the Acme rocket, lights the fuse, goes straight up. OK, right after you look at our data. We have it up there right after December 21, 2012. Fireballs and earthquakes of all magnitudes, both of them. The data is clear. It's the coyote riding the Acme rocket darn near straight up into the sky. And it has not abated. It keeps getting worse and worse and worse and worse. So, you know, again, I'm trying to shed some light. I'm trying to shed some hard science, empirical data, the kind of stuff you can take to the bank. But people much rather go, well, we were stupid back then, and we were built, and I was humiliated in front of my whole family, and I'm never going to look at it ever again because I want to die like an ignoramus. That's the smart thing to do. You know, people in awareness have a hard time. It's like, a person in awareness is like the only per is someone that has one good eye in the land of the blind, and the blind people are all saying, you know, you need to do the intelligent thing. Get a sharp stick and poke out your one good eye so you can be clever like the rest of us. You want to die that way, go do it. Best of luck with that. But for those in awareness, those that are seeing it coming, you know, they're quietly moving, they're relocating, they're doing what they're doing. In my church, one of the things I do when people come into the church, I do relocation conferences. I actually, and they can attend, it's free. I used to do this, I could, you know, for $100 an hour. Now I just do it for free for the folks that are in my church. And they can have as many conferences with me as possible. Why? Because... I'm about people surviving this. I'm going to keep doing it for as long as I can and just hope to God I can make a difference. Marshall Masters, great show. I'm kind of freaked out, to be honest. Hmm. I live right in the middle of the city, so I, I can't even get from one end, to down, one end of downtown to the other in an hour. Getting out of town in the middle of a crisis, it's not going to happen. Well, you know, I, I'm going to tell you, Russell... You're coming into awareness, 
And I'll tell you what the experience is like. It was the same for me, and it's the same for everybody else. Coming into awareness feels like somebody just up and slapped you upside the head with a dead salmon, and you're just standing there spitting scales, wondering what in the hell just happened. That's awareness, my friend. It will pass. And then you'll sit down and you'll decide, am I going to live intelligently and walk humbly with my God, or am I going to die like a fool? It's just as simple as that. To the audience, check out marshallmasters.com. You can get his newest book. Yes, Survival Wellness Advocacy and the Big Win. And at knowledgemountain.org, you can download that in free ebook edition. Okay. And I do it. If you're wondering, well, is this my cup of tea? Well, you know, get the book, get the ebook for free and read it. Because after you read that, you'll know if this is your cup of tea or not. No, you can't beat that, Marshall. And it didn't cost you a penny. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, and so should the audience. The link to the article is Planet X Nearing Perihelion is on the Russell Scott.